Okay. We're going to go right to the okay. Okay. Um, Our presentation will be focusing on manipulation and its role in criminal interrogation. <laughs> so what is interrogation? Interrogation is the process by which police officers interview suspected criminals in order to confirm their involvement in a crime. Many interrogations are performed even when there is enough evidence to trial a suspect. However, when a suspect confesses, this process is greatly simplified. In the following scenario, a suspected murderer is interrogated by a police officer. I'm going to ask you a few questions now. Please just answer yes or no. Is your name Madeline Loria? Yes. Your age is 27? Yes. All right. Is it true that you killed your 14-year-old son, William Loria? No. Ma'am? No. Okay, I'm going to ask you a few different questions now. Did you or did you not drive to Phoenix, Arizona with your son last week? I did. Why? We went to meet his father for the first time. Lucas Frederick? Yes. That's his father's name? Yeah, he left before I had the baby, so Will had never had him before. So this was just a chance for him to meet his father? Yeah. When did you go? Um, Will's birthday, so December 17th. And how did it go? It went well. Um, Lucas was really nice, and Will was excited, and got some presents and stuff. How long did you stay together, the three of you? Um, we had dinner, and then he left, and it was just me and Will in the hotel again. He didn't let you stay at his place? No. Um, he's married. Do you know the woman he married? No, not really. He's told me about her in letters. Well, what do you think about her? I don't know. Nothing? I'm not supposed to like her, right? <coughs> okay, so what happened after Lucas left the restaurant? Uh, I watched something on TV, and I heard a noise, and I guess that's when it happened. You're not sure what happened? Well, I saw it. I mean, after it happened, I saw it, and I figured it out, but... But what did you see? Um, I saw Will lying in the bathtub, and the tape player was in the tub with him, and I guess it fell in. You didn't drop it in? No. You have nothing else to say about this? No, actually. Um, not until I have my lawyer. All right. Well, I guess I have no further questions at this time. This is still an ongoing investigation, so we'll definitely see you again. Now, the events in this scenario indicated that the suspect was innocent. However, to the average person, her confession probably seemed a little uncertain. Legally, this was a valid interrogation. They would have probably let this woman return to her life, even though she actually murdered her son. The neutral language used by the interrogator and the available distractions, on, distractions like the pen on the table, allowed the suspect to conceal any emotions that may have been perceived by the interrogator. This is the root of the problem we're investigating. Because she was able to conceal her emotions, she was also able to manipulate her interrogator. She made the conscious decision to ask for her lawyer, thus retaining her ability to reason. And ultimately, the interrogator didn't learn anything he didn't already know. Which raises our first knowledge issue. How do humans obtain knowledge from other humans? So what made the scenario unrealistic? What you were probably looking for was manipulation. You've probably watched interrogations on an episode of CSI with lots of emotion and like extreme aggression and violence. While these methods are probably effective, they're not legal. In reality, most interrogations claim that the best way to gain knowledge from a suspect is to first gain their trust. In order to do this, an interrogator must use his ways of knowing to establish superiority. This may involve tactics such as increasing suggestibility, which is the willingness of a suspect to accept and act on suggestions by others. For example, you room, drink some water. No. You room, you've been telling me all day that you have a headache and you're probably dehydrated, so just drink some water. See, at this point, it's no longer a command, but she's involved my own welfare into the situation, which makes you more likely to act on her suggestion. Of course, this is on an extremely small level, but we can apply this to an, interrogative, an interrogation situation because interrogators must mold their suggestions according to the paradigm of the suspect they're interviewing. Another tactic that interrogators use is deception. 
In the United States, there is no law or regulation that forbids the interrogator from lying about the strength of the case, from making misleading statements, or implying that the suspect has already been implicated, Im implicated in the crime by someone else. This means that interrogators have full freedom to make up anything about the case just to obtain a confession from the suspect. When looking through this at an ethical lens, should this be allowed to happen? Should people lie in order to obtain truth? In the next skit involving the same characters, look for the forms of manipulative behavior that were previously mentioned. Now, uh, Miss Loria, I brought you some water in case you're feeling a little bit thirsty. Thanks. My name is Thomas Orban, and I'm the primary investigator of this case. See, my job is to make sure that you get the facts straight, and then we get to hear your side of the story. Okay? Alrighty, then let's begin. Now, these ones are the easy questions. All I need is for you to tell the truth. Can you do that for me? Mm-hmm. Now, I'm probably the hundredth person you've talked to, but I just need straight answers. For these questions, please just answer yes or no. Alright. Is your name Madeline Loria? Yes. And you're 27 years old? Yes. And you had a son, William Loria, 14 years old? I don't want to talk about him anymore. I know you don't. I know this is hard, but in order for me to help, we're going to have to go over what happened. I'm also going to need you to sign this. What is this? Well, you've probably heard of this before. It's called your Miranda Warning. What is it for? Well, Madeline, I want to discuss some things with you and share some things with you, but in order for me to do that, I have to read you your legal warning. Do you understand me? Now, the Miranda warning gives you the right to remain silent, the right to an attorney, but you have to waive, that means give up these rights, so that I can hear your side of the story, so that I can tell you what really happened. So will you sign it? Okay. Have some water, you must be thirsty. I'm not. I'll save it for later then. <clears throat> now, can you tell me exactly what happened? Can you do that for me? Um, I don't know where to start. That's alright, let's start at the beginning. How old were you when William was born? Thirteen. I was only thirteen and he left. Who left? Um, Lucas. He left me there and he, he didn't ever come back. He moved to Phoenix. Wow, that must have been really hard for you. What did you do? Well, I had the baby and I was so angry, you know, but at him. I hated him. I've always loved Will, though. But did Will remind you of him? I love Will. No, I hate him, but I love Will. But you contacted him, didn't you? Well, I thought that he should have some kind of relationship with his son. Um, so I sent him letters, but I guess that wasn't enough for Will and you. How often did you write to him? I don't know. Was last week the first time you saw him since Will was born? Yeah. Can you tell me about that? Um, I don't know. It went well, I guess. He was really nice to Will. And Gave him some presents and stuff. Can you describe Lucas to me? What was he like? I always trusted him. Which is probably stupid. I mean, he always used to promise things, and then he never kept his promises, and then, I don't know, I never thought he would leave me. How long were you with him that day? Uh, well, we had dinner, and then we went back to the hotel room. Um, he had to go to the school he works at. So what happened after he left? Um, I watched TV, and I can't remember what it was. But Will was watching with you? Um, no. It's alright. You can tell me. He was, um, he was taking a bath. Okay, okay. Now, uh, Madeline, what if I told you <clears throat> that you pushed the tape player into the bath? We have evidence for that. Um, I think that, um, I loved him, you know. Did you push the tape player into the bathtub? I didn't want to hurt him ever. I loved him. Did you and push the player into the bathtub? And we need you to say it, Madeline, yes or no. Did you push the tape player into the bathtub? I did. So what did you notice was different? 
Well, there were a bunch of uh, different things that were different, but the interrogator, for one, was much more friendly and much more personal than the last one. He offered her food and constantly reassured her of his good intentions. Also, the interaction within the space was much more intimate than the last scenario. This time, the interrogator was able to gain the suspect's trust enough to make her waive her rights. These are the Miranda rights. <clears throat> Interrogators aim to convince their suspects into waiving their rights in order to be able to pursue a much more aggressive investigation. Without a lawyer present, the interrogator has full freedom to ask anything they want about the case and demand an answer. And research has shown that guilty suspects are much more likely to waive their rights. This is because they are curious to find out how much the authorities know about their involvement in the crime. By waiving their rights, suspects believe they are heightening their perception, or gaining insight into the knowledge of the interrogator. In addition, guilty suspects will try to please the authority or appeal to his emotions in hopes that they will make themselves appear innocent. In this way, suspects think that they can outsmart police officers with their reasoning by agreeing to what officers say. However, in reality, when a suspect forfeits his rights, he doesn't know that his interrogator has just gained the upper hand. He doesn't realize that he has just proven to the officer that he has lost his rationalization. If the suspect were innocent, he would immediately demand an attorney. Research has also shown that guilty suspects are much less likely to eat food or drinks offered. The food experiment, as many interrogators call it, provides rational insight into the emotional state of the suspect. Have you ever felt so guilty about something that you can't eat? Perhaps the most um, important aspect of interrogations is to give suspects dignity. Because interrogative situations are dehumanizing, it's important that the subject feels respected. In the book Unbroken, Laura Hillenbrand states, Dignity is as essential to human life as water, food, and oxygen. The stubborn retention of it, even in the face of extreme physical hardship, can hold a man's soul in his body long past the point at which the body should have surrendered it. The loss of it can carry him off as surely as thirst, hunger, exposure, and asphyxiation, and with greater cruelty, as lethal as a bullet. Without a sense of dignity, a suspect will not be as willing to confide in his interrogator. These tactics are often very successful. However, some interrogations lead to more violent approaches, raising ethical concerns. In situations where interrogators may go even further than, mani than manipulation and resort to torture, some people may argue that if the suspect is believed to have committed acts of extreme violence, such as murder, he essentially forfeited his own human rights as soon as he made an attempt against the human rights of others, and therefore doesn't deserve mercy or compassion. Despite this argument, there is still a chance that the suspect is innocent, which can lead to cases of wrongful conviction some of which involve people on record actually confessing to crimes they didn't commit. If suspects are prone to lying, at what point should interrogators begin to believe them? Many interrogations are fundamentally biased, where the interrogator is already convinced that the suspect is guilty. What are the consequences of this? How does this affect the interrogation process? This brings us to the case of 14-year-old Michael Crow, wrongly convicted of murdering his own 12-year-old sister. Crow was so aggressively interrogated, he ultimately confessed to the crime. Okay. It's occurred later in the Michael Crow interrogation. Yeah. Oh, God. Now, in many course confessions, the suspect doesn't ever come to actually believe the story that they're confessing to, but they're in a situation where the police are lying to them about all this evidence they have, and the person thinks, all right, they're going to pin something on me. I might as well confess to something and get a better deal. But in Michael's case, it's really amazing. He really comes to believe that he might have done it. I don't 
And in fact, if they're telling the truth, there is no other logical possibility. He must have done it. In this situation, Michael has been stripped completely of his ability to rationalize. He's been mentally tortured into believing he murdered his own sister. And the only thing he knows how to believe now is the crime he's suspected of. The only thing he knows how to believe is that he's guilty. This raises our second knowledge issue. To what extent do preconceived ideas hinder the gain of truth? When you are convinced you're right about something, it becomes extremely difficult to hear out someone else's opinion. Similarly, when you are so sure that the person sitting in front of you has killed another human being, you're going to do everything to make sure they confess to it. With advances in today's criminal justice system, DNA testing raises the chances of honest prosecution. Nevertheless, cases of wrongful conviction continue to occur. This gives cause for organizations such as the Innocence Project, whose aim is to release thousands of wrongfully convicted prisoners by collecting evidence that was ignored during investigation and submitting appeals for the retrial of such cases. This brings us to our final knowledge issue. How do we know that what someone is saying is true? And furthermore, at what point should a case be closed? If interrogation develops to the point where you have stripped a subject of all dignity and rationalization, why should his confession still be valid? Nevertheless, Michael Crow, 14 years old, ultimately confessed to the murder of his own sister, and even believes that he did it. And one of the most disturbing things about this case is that the police officer's intentions are not bad. They simply want justice. They aren't trying to pin a murder on an innocent boy. They genuinely believe that they're doing their jobs and that he's guilty. They're not corrupt and they're not evil, they're simply human. They are just as susceptible as the, to the crime as the suspect is, and they acted on their intuition and emotions or the instinct that Michael was guilty of. So we leave you with this question. What's worse? The thought that some police are corrupt and forcing confessions out of people? Or that we lie in order to obtain truth. <laughs>